Good morning, fantastic Negrito. How are you doing? You well? I'm doing well. Better than some, not as good as others, but happy to be here. I hear that, man. I hear that. Good to speak to you. When I was doing the research for this interview, I said, you know what? There's no way we're going to get it all in in 20 minutes. But I really want people to understand your journey, sir. Um, I find that so many things that I found fascinating that made me deviate away from the music. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Have, you have indeed lived a life. Um, and I want I want people to get a snapshot of that in, in this little chat here. So without further ado, sir, could you kind of take me from the beginning? I know that you were born to an ed Oxford-educated Somalian father. Um, you were the eighth child of 14, born in Massachusetts, lived on a farm in Oakland, which I believe you're on right now. Yes. Away, sir. Fill people in. How is it you come to be sitting here today in charge of three grannies? Well, I want to tell you right now, some of this may come as a shock to you. And uh, but let's just do it here and let's get it. Let's get it done right. So, first of all, I was born to a man that was 33 years older than my mother. And he gave her the gift of 14 children. And I was the eighth of those of those 14 kids. That part is true. Uh, the new album that I made, which is an visual album, it's a, it's a film and, and an album because I had to do it, man. It was like the pandemic and there was just so many new things I was finding out about myself and my family. So let's start from day one. My father told us that he was from Somalia and we lived in New England and it was incredibly strange because we were black African, Muslim, and we lived in, in the whitest, most white Anglo-Saxon Protestant place that you could live. And it was called Great Barrington, Massachusetts. So right from the beginning, it was on. <laughs> and um, to move forward, because I know we have to go fast. At, when I was 12, I moved to Oakland, California. And we're talking about the whitest place in the world to 1980, where it's the blackest place in the world. And so, uh, you know, that was a culture shock for me. But it was also the most beautiful thing ever. I mean, I was coming at a time when it was the beginning of hip hop music, punk music, counterculture, uh, counterculture, um, weed. It was just unbelievable for a little kid. So as soon as I got to um, Oakland, I ran away from home. Because I found my home, I found my people, and I was 12. So I spent uh, a couple of years running around the streets until the police had caught up with me. And you know, I lived on the streets for two years with just gangs of other kids that were running away. And it was a pretty exciting two years. So I'm in foster care, and some of that's very traumatic. And uh, now I'm finally adopted by a good family by the time I'm 15. I'm living a good life like the Huxtables. I don't know if that's even... Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the thing. That's the thing. Don't worry, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I'm living a very good middle-class young black man existence. And I finally, you know, stumble onto something called creativity and music. I joined the creative community. Probably at around 17, I get into music and I discover... Uh, you know, I'm into rap, I'm into uh, Prince, I'm into Rick James, like anything that's funky and, and badass, I love it. So um, I decided to start pursuing music. And I, I discovered out pretty quickly that I'm a, a good songwriter. It's my dog here begging for some affection. So I'm, I'm writing songs and I, um, you know, I'm in the, in the mix in Oakland. <clears throat> Not only am I writing songs, but I'm in the streets. Because at that time, you know, crack was an epidemic. And every young person that's in growing up in, in those areas, <clears throat> you know, there in order to uh, get the American dream, you know, we're selling drugs. We're making crack and selling it. At the same time, we're, we're achieving all these material things. We're destroying our community. And that you know, it's still to this day, we can feel the echoes 
and the tremors of that destruction that my generation, uh, you know, brought forth upon our community, which is something that I'm ashamed of. But as a kid, you don't know. You know, you're just out there doing what other kids are doing. <clears throat> so I get into music after surviving some <clears throat> nefarious and very life-threatening situations with uh, lots of gunplay, I moved to Los Angeles to escape that. Moving it forward, and, I'm, and I have this dream, I'm going to become a star. I'm going to become the biggest star because I'm unique, I'm original, and I got my own thing. So there's a new label called Interscope. And uh, at the time, for your listeners, I'm 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 quite an older gentleman. <laughs> so I sort of like, wait a minute, Interscope new, yeah, hip hop <laughs> new, yes. I was I was around at that time. So um, I get this. All the record labels are, are bidding on me because I run into I ran into Prince's manager, and um, I don't know what happened there. I just lost you quickly, but you're back now, so it's fine. Go ahead, yeah, you ran into, into Prince's manager. Yeah. So Prince's manager signs me, and he meets up with a guy named Jimmy Iovine, who a lot of people know now, and they give me a million dollars. They're like, you're going to be the greatest. You're the best. You're a genius. Oh, my God, I love you. Do you want to, what do you want to have my kids, my wife, whatever you want? You know, that's, that's what <laughs> I'm, I'm, hey, I'm a, a little bit exaggerating. I can't go that far into that, but you can Google some of this, and there's some really weird stuff that's happening now with some of those people. Um, so I get this deal and I was like, my life has changed. I made it. I'm a star. I made it to the promised land. I'm going to be famous. You know, I'm looking over here. I see um, everybody. No doubt. All these groups are getting signed. I feel like I'm one of them. Death Row is happening. You know, I'm, you know, giving pounds <laughs> to Tupac. Man, I'm seeing everybody like, yeah, I'm on, on this label. I make this record and everybody's waiting for it. And it's a complete flop. It was the biggest deal probably ever signed, but it was probably the biggest flop ever. And I was devastated, 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 devastated. Um, I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know what depression was, but I think I was going through depression because I just, I was so young and I just thought, man, I, I made it to my goal, but I didn't understand the music business. So I understood music, but not the business. So what happens after that is fast forward. I'm just kind of toiling in obscurity around L.A. I have this huge deal. I have this money. And uh, one night I'm driving down Highland past Melrose in L.A. And I wake up and three weeks have passed. And I'm like, you know, I have this massive beard and long fingernails that I can't move. And I'm laying in a bed. And I look up and it's uh, one of the representatives from the record label that said, well, your dream came true. And I'm like, what? They said, you're dropped from the label. <laughs> wow. So literally, felt, literally, as soon as you came through, right? Wow. Yeah, I mean, that was like, I was in, I mean, you got to imagine three weeks in a coma. So what happened is if the, the viewers can see it, it took my hand from me. See how this hand moves? I can't move this hand to this day. Wow. And so that, that felt like, okay, that's the end. That's the end of, uh, you know, the dream that it happened came to a crash quick. And not only is it over, but my hand is gone. So I did what I knew what to do. I laid in the hospital. I started moving my fingers, moving my toes, anything. I was like, rehab, rehab. I'm making a comeback. As Muhammad Ali say, I'm the greatest of all time. And I always felt that inside, you know, being from such a strange family. So I was ready to fight. And, um, I guess, you know, I, re I re recreated myself and into this scene called Afro punk because I couldn't play. So I'd be like, man, I'll start a punk band and I'll be the lead singer. So I started a band called Blood Sugar X and I opened up these um, illegal after hours clubs in L.A. And I lived that existence, man. And I did that for years. And that was like an identity that made me feel confident. And um, I, I did that for a while. Can we and just can we just elaborate on that I, I, yeah. I, I promise i won't interject too much because there's it's so okay. much and i want i want everybody to know but that was one of the things that jumped out at me when i was doing the research right these parties so you were in a just to kind of put it in perspective a three thousand square foot apartment where you would literally throw the maddest parties with i'm i'm hearing hot tubs and naked women talk <laughs> to me man because they sound crazy yeah it was great you know i wanted to 
there was such an amazing uh, undercurrent of life in Los Angeles, which I found to be like this mainstream uh, Sunset Strip Hollywood Boulevard. So I was in the South where all the, um, you know, the blacks and Latinos were. And I was like the strange dude in the neighborhood that drove these old cars. And I do these amazing parties where we had a hot tub on the roof, full theater, uh, complete illegal um, bar and bands all night. It opened that at um, at midnight. They used to call me Mr. 1 a.m. So I met everybody there, man. I would see people would come in, man. I'd see, um, what's his name? Eric Benet or D'Angelo or, um, well, I'm getting old. I forgot some of these names, but some actresses, everybody was hanging out there. It was like the place, the place to be. And uh, it was just an incredible time of like rebirth and like getting my confidence and back back knowing that I could do something that was meaningful. So that goes on for a while. And then I started to find less fulfillment in it. I was getting older and I thought, you know what? I'm going to quit everything. I'm going to quit music, quit all these bands, quit everything I'm doing in L.A. And I moved to uh, Oakland to become a, a marijuana farmer. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so <laughs> I came and I did that. I thought, turn my back on music. It was like, this is going to be my second attempt at life or my third attempt, I guess, because the second was the nightclubs. And I did the farming and everything, had a kid and everything. I thought, yeah, this is it. I'm loving life, man. Opened an art gallery and did more uh, nude painting part, body painting parties. I bought it to Oakland back home <laughs> and, and this whole eccentric lifestyle and it was just incredibly fun, you know, and you didn't have to, as my grandmother said, we didn't have to ax nobody. And um, I really loved that. And that would really start to be the theme of my life later. So as I'm in my mid forties, one day I just had putting my son down. I couldn't get him to get to sleep. And I'm, you know, I had one guitar left that I never played. And I went, I picked up the guitar and I played a G major and he just, had the biggest smile and he still has that smile to this day it's his signature and I thought I shivered I almost cried and I felt afraid I had a, I didn't know what to do so then I thought wait a minute I started playing I was like wow music it moves people and I felt like a child again you know I felt like that kid that was 17 that had discovered music but this time I had the wisdom of an old man so I thought I really believe in this music that I'm starting to discover and play. Nobody wanted to hear it. They're like, man, what is this? Come on, man. You playing this? What is this? Come on, man. What is I don't even get it. What do you, I say? I call it Black Roots. And I'm trying to talk about, you know, it's, it's a blues based thing. You know, they didn't want to hear it. So I just said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go play in the streets. And I didn't know that that was going to take me on my next journey, which was winning the Tiny Desk Contest in a... Uh, 2015 and that put me on the world map the lesson there was when I went for it the first time I wanted something I wanted something I want to be famous I want to have cars I want to have money I want to have hoes whatever I want to give it a big house probably the second time I was going through it, it was anger because I lost my hand and I was trying to prove something I was mad at the industry but I still wanted in I think the third time I approached it I didn't want anything anymore I wasn't looking for it anymore. I just had the voice and I was going with riding on the shoulders of my ancestors who I would really come to know through this journey. And I went through and I recorded one album, two albums, three albums, and uh, people got to hear my art and won Grammys. And then the pandemic happened. So when the pandemic happened, this is when I discovered the truth. I'm online searching and I find out that everything my father told me was a lie. And the things my mother told me was a lie. I wasn't from Somalia. He wasn't from Oxford. My mother's family was this vast family, which I found my third generation, great, great, great grandfather. I saw his picture online. He was born a slave in Georgia. I found out all this information. So I want to get, so the idea came to my head. When I thought of my daddy, I forgave him. You know why? I thought my dad was born in 19. Oh, five. And he was smart and he was brilliant and he was abusive and crazy. But you know what? If you were smart and brilliant at that time, that could be a death sentence. So I thought to myself, white Jesus, black problems. I kept saying it. 
I was sitting in a hotel in Atlanta. Uh, me and E-40 just did a song. And we had put it out on the show called Black Lightning. I said, white Jesus, black problems. I'm going to tell the story of my father. How did he challenge the edifice of white supremacy being so smart? He changed his name, made up a whole story about where he was from, educated in Oxford, Somali ambassador, this crazy last name, so that he could navigate through life and still be a man. Instead of asking for permission, the same thing came into my life. We ain't got to ask nobody. So to, I thought that was the story until I saw my mother's side. And I see these black people dressed all dignified. And I looked at the year. I said, that's during the time of slavery. How y'all come on? Where y'all get them clothes from? That don't look right. So I start doing the research on them. And I find my third generation that says free black Negroes. I'm like, what? Fourth generation couple free black Negroes. They can read, they can write, they own their own property. Fifth generation, free black Negroes. This, I'm tripping. I'm like, man, I talk all this shit to these white people and now I got free people in my family. I felt a little, I felt a little <laughs> weird. Six, hey, sixth generation, free black people. Man, now I'm like, I get to the seventh generation, you know, more black people. It says free woman. I mean, indentured servant. And I read a document that says, your seventh generation grandmother, a white Scottish woman, Elizabeth Gallimore, is presented in Amelia County Court for unlawfully cohabitating with a Negro slave belonging to Henry Jones of Virginia. Then I thought, oh, I found my people. <laughs> i like, these people didn't give a damn. And they were going to do what they had to do. And I thought, wow, those are the people that I came from. So that's all. It ended during the pandemic. I hope I got everything in. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Because you kind of went even further than I thought you would do um, with that. I didn't expect you to. Obviously, that's a Revelation exclusive, but I appreciate you sharing. Um, let's get into the music before I even revisit some of what you just outlined. Yes. Right? Highest bidder. Right, that's the first track that you put out. Why? Yes. Um, and you kind of started to outline what you did, outline why you called the album the name that you did. Um, and for those that may have missed it, Why Jesus, Black Problems is the name of the album. Um, Highest Bid is the first track you put out. Talk to me about, because you seem very calculated about how you're naming each part of this project. Well, it, so? all, it all started with the money. Everything goes to the highest bidder. When I read that my white Scottish grandmother was an indentured servant, I was like, man, they were pimping out their own people too. And then the fact that she had a child with a enslaved person, which I'm the descendant of, and they let it go. They were like, okay, you're gonna, these kids are going to work for us for seven years. I'm like, these people were following the money. The distraction is race that we got caught up in. We're caught up in race and I get it because it's the system is mighty and it crushes us but it started with the money so that's why it was very helpful to me to focus on man these people worship money they don't worship nothing else they'll sell their own mother <laughs> you understand if they if they can make some money off it so that's why I started with that part yeah so what's the look of what's the feel of the album then talk to me because you talked about um I don't know if we called it on camera or off camera but you talked about reconnecting with the soil and the pandemic being a real period for you to reflect in that aspect. Elaborate for me. Well, I think that for African-American people, especially some of us, you know, that are descendants to the slave trade, I think we see that soil and we take off in the other direction. Where I feel like this is the thing that is going to heal us. Anytime you have trauma, I think the best thing to do, you go back and you face it because the soil is rich. The soil provides. The soil is good for it. We can, like you say, you want to know what's in your food, grow what's in your food. And this is something very powerful and therapeutic and medicinal and healing. And it's just, it's so powerful for a human being to connect with that soil. But it has been a point of trauma for um, African-Americans and for Africans and anyone else who's been exploited by um, industrialism and, and this extreme uh, predatory capitalism that rapes pillages and, and punishes us people. You, you stepped away. You mentioned you stepped away from the music, right? In five years. 
right? And you got back in 2007, if my research is correct, yeah? Yeah, around, and, 2000, around 2000, um, I'd say around 2013. Okay, so maybe, so I, I was going to say, so in those years, you mentioned your son, but in those years, what else contributed to shaping your character and who you were? Well, I, I want to go back to grandma. Gra the fact that, you know, grandmother would always tell me, like, you know, I say, grandma, tell me about the South. How bad were white people? Tell me. And I got ready to let me hear the good stuff. And grandma, I remember she said, you know what, honey? I always start off with honey. She said, we didn't have to ask white people for anything. And I remember that made me freeze. I was young, but I was like, yeah. She, she said, we didn't have no problem. Your grandfather, neighbors, everybody. We had a collective as colored farmers, as she said it. Negro people, we had hogs, we had chickens, we had land, and we grew our crops. So we weren't in the position of being vulnerable, asking for things, and this gave us a lot of power. And so that helped me grow some weed. <laughs> I'm like, y'all grew chickens, I grow weed. You know what I mean? Because that, I, I saw, <laughs> but I mean, grandma would approve because this was a viable way for, um, to be independent self-sustaining, you know what I mean? Self-reliant. We ain't got to ask nobody. So that was important part. I didn't know I was going to find this incredible wealth of, of a story about my family and write white Jesus, black problems. But that was the beginning of that. And that was always in our DNA. It was always in me. I wondered like, why? What's why I'm hustling like this? I remember my friends would be like, man, you're an immigrant. Man, this immigrant over here be hustling. Man, I'm selling incense. Man, I'll let me let me cut your lawn. Let me do whatever. I was like that as a kid. So it was in the DNA. So growing, growing the weed and, um, you know, letting my friends, we all shared the money. One of them now is writing Captain America, works for Marvel. But it all started because of that collective. I love the way you just slipped that in there at the end. It's real. Your journey, right, in terms of you stepping back into the music in early 2013, 2012, 2013, and then your arts being received to the point where you get that Grammy, then you get another one, then you get another one. Yeah. What, is, what does that feel like in terms of vindication? Like, you've already touched on the fact that your whole motivation, your whole energy is different now, right? So it's not for what it was for before, but... That being a cherry on top and a candle on your cake, it, it, what does that feel like? What does it mean? I mean, if I, I'd be a liar if I said it didn't mean something. It does mean something. You know, once in a while, I'd smile to myself and I'd go, well, you know, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we, we, we did it. We did what, and I think about my ancestors again. I think about their challenges and I think they felt like the same way. Like, hey, we did it. They tried to roadblock us, but we did it and we did it on our own terms without selling our ass or selling our community out that we're actually con contributing something. So that is great. But honestly, I don't even keep those Grammys like on display. Like I keep them for like a week and I wrap them up, I pack them, I never look at them again and I won't till I'm an old man. I'm already, you know, <laughs> older man. <laughs> Cause I'm gonna tell you, I mean, that's a road to that same thing that got me as a kid, that vanity, that, hey, man, you can have, come in this room, man. We got all kinds of things in here, you know? <laughs> that's just like, you know, I'm, I'm free from that. And I, that's a beautiful existence, man. I live right here on a farm with kids and animals. And, oh, I love that, man. And, and going out and picking the, what you want to eat for dinner, just go get it, go in the morning, get your eggs, cook on a 1940s O'Keefe and Merritt stove and, Oh, it, this is the this is peace and tranquility and love and community and, and, and working with the community, not so much giving to the community like, man, I receive so much that's intangible. And it's not in dollars and awards, but just love and friendship. Beyond the music, then, what's what's keeping you motivated? You mentioned you touched on something. I won't really go into it, but. What, 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 what's coming from Fantastic Negrito? Well, I like what you said, keep me motivated, because I love that word, now being in my 50s. Woo! I love the word inspiration and motivation. Because <laughs> that's, that's like, you know, that's the most powerful coffee you can drink. And, um, you know, what keeps me motivated is, is, is a living for other people, in a, in a sense. You know what I mean? Like, in terms of, I know that the decisions that I make, it's not 
it can affect a lot of people. So that is a huge motivation factor for me. And what's next is getting the work is telling stories. The oldest thing in the world is stories. What keeps us going are stories. I mean, we have written histories, but even in Africa, the tradition of oral stories. Look at, I just watched Roots again and look at how Alex Haley, he found his lineage because of stories. And I think even in the blues, like people uh, get so caught up in so many guitar notes and I'm playing the blues. And, uh, but what's really in the blues is what my grandmother was telling us was stories, these powerful stories. And it's, it, it translates into jazz. It's playing them stories, you know, and it, it's in the hip hop stories, man. So it is. Um, I'm so focused on that. I started a record label. I started a, a, a open air market. I did that during the pandemic so that friends that I knew that had restaurants could start making money again because I had this big lot. So that that's um, something that's going on. And just, yeah, just hopefully working on other people's records. I, you know, hopefully this music and this film that I did may be my last. And I'll be able to make other people's stories happen. You know, that's a big part of what I'm thinking these days. But now we got to tell the story of white Jesus, black problems. And I'm going to well, do that for the next two that's years. That's what I was just about to say, man. We were talking about, <laughs> you've got a lot of yeah. touring to do. If you know what white, white Jesus, black problems explained, you've got a long way to go. We ain't talking about the end yet. Listen, you're here, album out in June, by the way, for those listening. And you're here. June 3rd. June 3rd. Um, you're here in July. I hear, by here, I mean the UK, um, at the Jazz Cafe for a couple of dates. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Um, I just invited myself and you're there. Thank you. And I want to know what you like about being in the UK. You know, what, what is it that you're looking forward to most about? I mean, obviously sharing your art and singing and performing, but what else beyond that? Well, I must have liked some. I just, I got my DNA test and it said I'm 27% like Northern European, English, Scottish. Now that's a, there's something there I must have felt it was in the water, my friend. No. That's why it started but, uh, raining when we connected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I just, UK has just always been, a, you know, a country that really appreciated what America did and even, you know, helped us amplify it and take it a step further and um you know I, I love that about the uk the openness of the people and um it's kind of in the arts i feel like there's a fearlessness always with the uk and uh, I, I just i really appreciate it man and i love the food there too it's amazing it's so diverse you can find every kind of man caribbean african uh you know uh european a middle eastern the food is amazing there and i think that People have found a way to get along there in a way that's different from the States. And I'm not saying better or worse, but they have different baggage. So it's a whole different thing. And you get a whole different type of uh, uh, black people out there. And I, I really enjoy it. Fantastic, Negrito. It's been fantastic talking to you. So real pleasure. Trust me, I've enjoyed this one. And I know people who watch my interviews all the time, Kat included, um, they're going to know that I really enjoyed this one. It's, it, I, when you come, we're probably going to have to sit down and chop it up a little bit more because there's, there's a whole load of stuff. There's a whole lot of things that we didn't mention that we couldn't, but I really want people to tune into the music and and, and, and be prepared for this album um, coming out June 3rd. Is there anything else you want to leave us with? Oh, no, man. Go? I think I've overstayed my welcome. I know I dropped so much on everybody. I know it's a lot, but try to do it in a condensed way. And I appreciate you giving me the platform. No, and I appreciate your time, man. Stay blessed. Thank you. Take care, man. Peace. See you in England, man.